Today we're going to take a look at the production cost of coffee. This is a really important last step in understanding what these transparency figures mean. Because why are we really interested in these numbers? In all likelihood, one of the main reasons we're interested in price transparency in the first place is in order to make sure that the producers, the most vulnerable link in the coffee supply chain, are earning what they need and what they deserve. But of course that farmer or farm gate price means nothing if we don't know how much of it they're spending to produce the coffee. So it's extremely important to understand the farmer's production costs in order to understand what that farmer price really means to them. Now just to get it out of the way, if you're waiting for me to tell you what the production cost is, get ready to be disappointed. Like almost everything we've talked about on this channel so far and everything we will talk about, this subject includes a lot of nuance depends on so many factors and is a little bit different in every single case. We are going to take a look in this episode, however, at the factors that can influence production costs, how to get to the bottom of this, and how to interpret that number. production cost is essential to give context to the farmer price or farm gate price. Without this information or at least an idea of some proxies we can use to understand average production costs for farmers, farm gate price is just a random number on a paper. Without context, data means nothing. So first of all, as we get into this, let's give some context to what we mean by production costs. Production of what? By whom? Of course, these variables are going to be different depending on your supply chain. For the sake of the example, let's say this is dry parchment coffee produced by the cultivator or farm proprietor. In order to give additional context to this information and the calculations we're doing here, it's important to keep in mind that the producer's expenses are going to be in their own local currency, not in the buyer's local currency. As we saw a few videos ago, this number is going to depend on the exchange rate. So the production cost of the farmer in the buyer's local currency is going to change every day and every minute. Unless, of course, the buyer and the seller use the same currency, which is sometimes the case. The farmer's production cost is going to depend on many, many different factors. It would be impossible for me to rattle off each and every one of them for you. One, because there are so many, and two, because there are probably some that I haven't even thought of because I'm not familiar with how coffee is grown and, and all of the things that farmers have to pay for everywhere in the world. But what I am going to provide is a framework and some examples that should help when you're investigating the production costs of the farmers that you work with. Some of these factors are going to depend on the location where farming is taking place, as will supply chain costs as we saw in, in that video a few weeks ago. For example, depending on the location, there will be different labor laws which will affect the cost of production, considering the operations that are performed by outside or hired labor. For example, the minimum wage, the formality of employment, and the enforcement of these laws. Related to this will be the cost of living. This can vary region to region, province to province, not only nationally. Taxes and regulations. These could be related to labor, such as insurance, minimum wage, employment tax, vacation allowance, things like this. The cost of imports such as fertilizers and soil conditioners are often imported from other parts of the world as well as farm equipment in a lot of cases. The cost of exporting uh, will in most cases be more related to the supply chain which is different from the on-farm production cost but sometimes will have an impact here as well. Logistics and geography, so the cost of bringing supplies to the farm, the cost of bringing people to the farm. I've heard of some areas where coffee is grown it's very difficult to access, so farmers have to offer the workers food and shelter or else they just won't come. So this is an additional cost that farmers are having to cover. Whether or not hand picking is happening, which, which can depend in part on geography and topography, among other things. Climate and weather, which will affect the yield, given certain investments are made in producing that are then distributed over the harvest. The number of kilos of coffee brought in is going to determine over how many kilos those costs are spread and therefore the per kilo cost of production. The production cost is also going to depend a lot on practices and different decisions that are being made by the farm proprietor. 
which processes are performed. This could have to do with the actual farm, so how coffee is grown, how many times per year, how much fertilizers apply, what kind of pest control measures are implemented, what kind of pruning and weeding is, is implemented. This will involve at least the amount of manual labor that's implemented, as well as some inputs that may or may not be purchased. What kind of wet milk processing is taking place? Is coffee going to be depulped and fermented? Is it natural processed? Are cherries being selected for color? Are they being flood sorted? And this will mostly have to do with the cost of labor involved in wet milling one kilo of dry parchment. What infrastructure is being utilized? The cost of production is not only what has to be paid directly to make one kilo of coffee today. The production cost also includes the infrastructure being used that had to be purchased at one point in time and is then being amortized or distributed over its useful life its useful life in time and or the output it produces. There are quite a lot of different infrastructure setups that could be implemented in farming as well as wet milling. Some very simple and artisanal, others very high tech and expensive. We're also going to be amortizing or distributing over the useful life different investments aside from infrastructure. This could include planting, renovation, pruning, so how often are coffee trees taken out and replaced with new ones? This is going to depend a lot on uh, different agricultural decisions that are being made, including the variety that's being planted. And there are quite a lot of decisions that will depend on the quality that a producer is going for, not least whether hand-picking is implemented or not. And aside from these factors that are more or less inherent, there's also a question of efficiency. Just how well is this working? How fast and effective are these processes being carried out? How effective is management at ensuring a good productivity of labor. The inherent context of coffee producing and the decisions made about how it's being grown and processed are no guarantee of a certain cost of production. Not all investments pay off. Differences in economies of scale could have a great effect on the cost of production of one kilo of dry parchment. The difference in per unit cost based on the size of the operation. For example, the labor cost of roasting coffee on a 1 kilo drum versus a 15 kilo drum is going to be quite different. This is because of economies of scale. This is a really simple, obvious example. In coffee production, it's oftentimes not as simple. For example, if we're looking at infrastructure capacity and productivity of labor, it's likely that there will be opportunities to take advantage of economies of scale. But if we think about labor, the cost and productivity of labor in total for a large farm employing 100 people versus a very small farm where four family members are the only ones working, in many cases it's likely that the large farm will have a much higher per unit cost of labor because there's a lot of administration, bookkeeping, back office, unaffiliated employees will inevitably not be as productive as family members who stand to benefit equally from performance and management, hierarchy, employee coordination. All of this absorbs resources and isn't necessary for a very small farm operated by the family who owns it and lives there. So a lot of these decisions come down to a yield focus versus a quality focus. Risk is another factor that's not a cost in the sense that it's an expense, but is also something that needs to be taken into account. For example, if an importer is inevitably selling 10% of the coffee they buy at liquidation prices, this is not a cost. It's a risk, but that risk can be quantified and should be included in a cost structure when one is analyzing their supply chain, understanding their profitability, and, and looking to set prices. So there's, there's a risk that quality won't exist. You can have a quality focus and incur a greater cost per kilo of dry parchment, but that's no guarantee that those measures that you take are going to lead to actual quality. So incurring those additional costs implies a risk should the quality desired not materialize because there is no award for effort. Yield is a risk. So you spend a fixed amount of money to plant coffee, take care of these plants, fertilize the land, control pests, but you don't know how much is going to come off the trees when harvest time comes, as well as a commercial risk. So if you have a quality focus, you incur additional costs that those with a yield focus do not, and you end up creating very high quality. Even still, there's no guarantee that someone's going to purchase it from you or purchase it at a price that makes it worthwhile. So this is your commercial risk. I wanted to focus especially on opportunity cost, mostly because it's not actually a, a cost in the sense that it's an, an expense. No one's spending the opportunity cost. However, in a lot of the cases where I've seen 
coffee production costs expressed and analyzed, they include some kind of an opportunity cost of free labor. So the actual farm proprietor and potentially other family members that work on the farm but are not compensated with a salary or an hourly wage. Because some farmers use family labor and other farms use hired labor, a lot of times a number is stuck in there to account for this family labor. And that's fine if that's the way we're looking at it, but it needs to be consistent. If this is money that's not actually being spent by anyone, rather money that someone thinks that they should be earning, these are quite different situations. So first, what is the opportunity cost? An opportunity cost is the missed opportunity of not doing something else. So if you could make one investment that yields 20%, but instead you make an investment that yields 10%, the opportunity cost of that second investment is 10%, the 10% that you would have made had you made the decision to go the other way and invest in the other thing that would have yielded you 20%. So it's not a cost. It didn't cost you anything, but it's a foregone opportunity. So in the case of coffee farming, the opportunity cost of family labor is the amount of money they would have made had they worked doing something else. So this is where it becomes quite hypothetical and there are any number of ways of calculating what the opportunity cost might be. It depends on what potential opportunities may or may not exist for that individual. We could compare it to picking some elsewhere on another farm, working as a farm employee somewhere else, in coffee or otherwise. I notice some farmers going to the city and, and a lot of times end up working in construction. But this calculation could change quite a lot if we were comparing coffee farming, so out there picking cherries and processing coffee, to a professional career as like a lawyer or a doctor or something. This may not be the case the majority of the time, but it just goes to show that opportunity cost is different for each individual and situation. This also includes family labor. I mean, if the whole family were to pick up and go pick coffee somewhere else, how much money would they make versus how much profit they make, how much they make producing coffee on their own farm. A common flaw I see in this argument and the inclusion of an opportunity cost based on an off-farm employment is the relative family cost structure implied by any of these potential alternatives. So maybe a, a coffee producer would earn more currency working on construction in the city, but they'd also have to live in the city. What's the difference between cost of living in the city versus on their own farm? They have to pay rent, which they, like, they don't have to pay on their own farm. They have to pay for transportation from their apartment to their job and back. And in a majority of cases, small coffee farms are producing a significant portion of, of the food that the family is consuming. If working construction in a city, this is not an option anymore. So we can't just plug in a construction salary as if it were a cost of living and working on one's own farm. Another factor is the non-financial quality of life or the family's happiness and satisfaction living in a city and working construction versus living in the countryside, living and working on their own farm. Financial income is in everything. So this notion of the opportunity cost is useful for some things, but it's not part of a profit calculation and should not be included in any sort of break-even calculation because it's not an expense that's being incurred. The opportunity cost is useful for decision analysis. So if you're thinking about selling the farm and going to the city and working construction, this will be useful in comparing the financial profitability of farming coffee versus doing something else. Whether to keep farming coffee or whether to cut down your coffee, throw a few cows on there that don't require any maintenance and go pick coffee somewhere else. Cut down your coffee and put in avocado trees. And whether to take half of your farm and you know, cut down the coffee trees and start producing something that requires less of your own labor or cover more of your family cost of living. Then once you do have this production cost number, based on all the factors we discussed here, as well as an opportunity cost for the farmer, at that point we can start to look for trends. What did it actually cost to produce this coffee versus what it should reasonably cost to produce this coffee? Because like we saw, efficiency and effectiveness of labor is always going to be a little different. And if we're using this number to set the purchase price, the FOB or roaster price, we need to take into account the cost of making this coffee as well as the value that it's providing. If it costs one farmer two dollars for if it costs one farmer two dollars to produce a pound of coffee and it costs another farmer next door a dollar fifty, should someone have to cover that two dollar production cost? Understanding production cost doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to always be covered whose responsibility is it to make sure coffee farming is 
profitable for everyone. I'd argue there are certain cases where the production cost does not justify the value created in the sales price that can be demanded. The idea of always covering a farmer's production cost, even if it's an extremely inefficient operation, essentially becomes incentivizing inefficiency. Not that production costs shouldn't be taken into account, but these are, these are decisions everyone needs to be making about their own supply chain, considering all the factors that we discussed here. Now that we have an idea in very broad strokes of the factors that can determine coffee's production cost, in the next video we're going to take a look at efficiency, the idea of price floors that are somehow tied to production costs, as well as farm profitability. So with all this price transparency information we have, we know who's making what, we know basically how much it costs to produce coffee, therefore we can figure out basically what the farmer's profitability is. So how profitable should a coffee farmer be? This is another tricky idea. There are a lot of ways of approaching it and it's really going to depend on everyone's personal approach and values. So in the next video, we're going to dig into a few ways that one could consider approaching it. I hope you've enjoyed this video on coffee production costs. If this has brought up any additional questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And if you got some value out of this, please consider subscribing. We're really just at the beginning here of a massive topic, so plenty more videos are going to be coming out weekly. For anyone who doesn't know already, Cedro Alto is a coffee farmers collective in Colombia, and my main responsibility is finding homes at roasteries for the coffees produced by our members. We have spot coffees in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and we have a big harvest on the way. So if you're interested in sourcing coffee through us, please feel free to get in touch. My contact information is in the description here. Thank you.